Good morning from Swiss Next San Francisco at Pier 17. I'm Mary Ellen Johnson, head of exhibitions at Swiss Next, where we connect Switzerland to the Western half of the US in art, science, innovation, and education. Today, I'm excited to host our third program this week, set to open our one year online residency with Geneva based artist, Lauren Hooray. Lauren works in video installations, performances and collages, and her research is based on an ongoing examination of the influence of media and tech culture on belief systems. Over the next months at Swissnex, she will continue her research on media bewitchment, illusions of automation, and the performative power of images, focusing on recovery and remedy processes from the cursed media with events and actions such as collective workshops, seminars and panel discussions like today, calls for participation and performances. We're excited that Lauren can take her already three years of research around content moderation to the next level here in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley, the heart of the technology industry. Her residency will culminate in an exhibition in the fall of 2021, which was postponed from this year due to COVID-19. I'll give you a few words about what to expect today for our event. First, the event is recorded. We encourage you during the talk to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to add questions which will be answered at the end of the program and at the end of the discussion. Also, in an effort to bring new life to the Zoom webinar format, we invite you to interact with the speakers. Going to the next level, we invite you to raise your hand if you would like to come on screen with the speakers and ask questions. If you'd like to do that, raise your hand, make sure your camera and your mic is on and you'll be live. We, we're, we welcome anyone who has questions, opinions, suggestions, theories or beliefs to join the conversation. Now I hand the discussion over to Lauren. She will share a few words about her practice and research and set the context for our brilliant researchers and speakers today. Hamid Ekbia from Indiana University and Sarah T. Roberts from UCLA. Thanks, Lauren. Um, thanks, Mary. So I'm Lauren Nure, um, and I'm a visual artist. I will first uh, here uh, introduce our panelists today and then I will explain what got me interested in their research and what we can try to do together today. I am very thrilled to cyber welcome uh, Thara and Hamid today. What wonderful researchers. Um, they are doing a very important work in the field of um, digital labor in particular. And they also are, uh, are both very influential in the outcomes of my practice and my work as a visual artist. I am very honored by your participation, so thank you so much. Um, I want to insist a little bit here how it's important for me as a visual artist to confront my ideas and my work to research and uh, researchers and academics. It really brings ideas and perspective and resources and, and ways to look at the world for me. For a bit of context, um, and I'm gonna start um, just to uh, share a few things here. <clears throat> so I had the pleasure to meet uh, Sarah T. Roberts last year, uh, just right before uh, COVID actually, pre-COVID time, last January. We were invited to do a talk around content moderation in Paris at La Gaîté Lyrique with uh, Antonio Casilli, um, and we were all invited by Marie Lechner. The conversation between Sarah and Antonio was brilliant, and I learned a lot. To introduce Sarah uh, here in few words uh, more officially, Sarah is an associate professor at UCLA and co-director at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. And I'm just going to quote your bio here, Sarah, because I really love this sentence. It is written on the internet since 1993. She was previously an information technology professional for 15 years. And as such, her research interests focus on information work and workers 
and on the social, economic, and political impact of the widespread adoption of the internet in everyday life. <clears throat> you wrote a book that was published last year by Yale University Press called Behind the Screen Content Moderation, The Shadow of Social Media. And this book is like summing up eight years of uh, your research on content moderation. To introduce um, Hamid Egbia here, I first heard about Hamid's brilliant essay, Eteromation and other stories about computing and capitalism that he co-wrote with Bonnie A. Nardi through uh, Yves Citon, who published an excerpt translated in French in the magazine Multitude. Um, he is a professor of informatics, international studies and cognitive science at Indiana University, Bloomington, where he also directs the Center for Research on Mediatic Interaction. He is interested in the political economy of computing, in the future of work, and in how technologies mediate socio-economic, cultural, and geopolitical relations of modern society. Um, yeah, this is the multitude thing. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Uh, we are here all together in this uh, in the cyber moment, thanks to Swissnet San Francisco institution that is supporting big time my practice this coming year, in many ways possible. And I want just briefly here to thank um, Mary Ellen Johnson, head of exhibition at Swissnet San Francisco, to give me the opportunity to conduct my research, and to allow me to invite other people to participate and contribute to it but also to give me the platform uh, where some of, my, uh, some of my questions can be raised and answered. I want to specify here again that I have a strong attachment to the Bay Area, for the Bay Area and San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, because for me, it's such a complex land full of ideas, uh, theories, innovations, contradiction. And for me, it's a land that combine, you know, scientific breakthrough, tech ideologies, uh, tech mysticism, which is a term that I use a lot, but I can really um, briefly define by like the use of technological tools or tech theories to access uh, at a godlike status or a godlike knowledge. So for me, it's a very fertile uh, ground for a visual artist, a one that combines very, you know, business money oriented um, uh, industry and bigger ideas on a more spiritual level. A bit of why I invited Sarah T. Roberts and Amit Egbia in conversation today. I have been doing research around a pretty big question this last few years, a question that I don't know if I would ever have the, all the answers, but this uh, infinite quest is an intriguing intellectual challenge, and it's nurturing my art practice in many ways. The question is, we as humans, and in human history, of all, uh, you know, people have uh, access to a computer or a phone with an internet connection. I've never been so much overwhelmed and flooded by content, maybe various by its form, shapes, and meanings. So, in the heart of the question, uh, is containing the status of the media and the medium. What changed for me? Uh, and for everybody, the shifting pa paradigm at stake here for me is that internet was had hurt a medium that you can modify, you can add to it, you can create, and most important, you can add the content of your choice and share it with others. In the 2000s, some companies started to find ways to monetize and use that content that we call now uh, UGC for user generated content. But there was at heart a flow in that money plan. Um, you know, the platform where everybody can share their content must be uh, moderated, must be contained and censored. And the notion that Facebook called at first the grandma effect, meaning like if a grandmother wants to see a picture of her grandchildren on the platform, um, maybe some other videos of cats and dogs, so news, whatever, she would be very unhappy to see, for example, porn videos or dick pics and other inappropriate content. And we all agree uh, this is a metaphor of sort. It's a, it's a stereotype to underline the main problem. Social media companies want, uh, want of course, that uh, we are staying engaged on the platform. And um, 
if we don't see content that uh, you know doesn't please us, uh, we we might leave. So that's where it starts to become complex in a sense with uh, now uh, you know misinformation, fake news, content manipulation, and so on. But I'm sure Sarah and Amid have much to say about all this, and we will understand a bit more of all this in a moment. As humans, a specific category of workers are directly impacted by this type of economy and as the content moderators. To understand the complexity and harshness of this job, these workers are flooded with thousands of gruesome content on a daily basis that they have to sort out. I mean, they just not simply have to look at it, they have to take decisions meaning that they have to analyze it in order to make that decision. So in that sense, this vast pool of workers is a part of humanity that is seeing the worst of humanity, the worst of it, the worst of human ideas and actions. And they have to experience it through a single window, seated on a chair and looking at a screen. It is a very specific situation here for me, and I can't help but just seeing, is, uh, just seeing it as a form of torture. In short, being uh, often poorly paid to analyze horrible stuff. So I guess the main goal for this talk today is to understand a little bit more on how social media and sharing platforms works. What is at stake when we use them? Who are the workers that are maintaining a practicable and safe network for uh, regular users? And maybe we'll find collective approaches and solutions to see what we can do as users, as humans, and as citizens. Um, and if we have time, we might be able to tackle the idea that, and I quote Manos uh, Tsakiris here, we live in the age of global visual politics where images have the capacity to become political forces themselves. <laughs> Um, last precision before um, uh, beginning this talk, I will use a word that Sarah is employing to name uh, the big tech companies. She called them the mega tech, and I'm going to stick with that because I really like it. So Sarah, we're going to start with you, and I'm just going to ask you a pretty general question. So how did you become interested in the field of content moderation in the first place? And can you explain us in short, what is it exactly? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to, to be with you once more. Uh, the way that I became interested in this, in this phenomenon, because it, it constitutes um, more than just the work or the workers, uh, is that in 2010, uh, I was working on my PhD in uh, the cornfields of, of central Illinois at the University of Illinois Champaign, Urbana-Champaign. And uh, I was uh, having a coffee one day and reading the New York Times. And in that uh, particular edition of the New York Times in a fairly small article relegated to one of the interior sections of the paper was a story about a group of workers uh, who were in fact just one state over from me in uh, agricultural uh, Midwestern Iowa. And they were working in a call center environment as described by the article. What they were doing was screening social media content for other companies unnamed uh, that they were responsible for essentially through a, a subcontracting process. And they were screening that material based on uh, rules that were given to them by their, uh, the companies that had contracted them for appropriateness for a particular site. Uh, it, it, you know, again, in 2010, it became clear to me in an instant as already someone who had been working in, um, you know, as you said, I had, had a career in information technology and, and in computing and uh, was working on this PhD in information science. It, it, it suddenly became clear to me what a vast problem it must be 
uh, in, in many directions for uh, social media companies effectively to control what flowed over their uh, branded channels. And I also realized in that instant that of course, they had to have a system to maintain that control because they were uh, in essence, commercial venues uh, soliciting advertising companies uh, and attracting them as their primary clients. And so of course they were not going to allow uh, just anything. This, uh, this was a realization that seems so uh, simple and so self-evident where we sit today, but even in 2010, this, uh, this realization that I had flew in the face of the rhetoric of the firms themselves, which were still promulgating a notion that, uh, that their platforms were in essence the new public square, that they were uh, fundamentally con concerned with free expression. YouTube's own slogan was broadcast yourself. So there was this notion that it was the, a relationship predicated on you to the platform, to the world without any uh, anyone in between. And I also, knowing what I did about the state of computation at the time, uh, had a sense that, of course, humans had to be involved in any kind of decision-making process that had to do with the acceptability of the material for the simple reason that th that the cognitive uh, uh, processes and, and competencies that go into that decision uh, were beyond the, the capabilities of computation at the time. And one might argue still, still are, uh, although there are many more automated tools being deployed now. So uh, I realized in that moment 10 years ago that there had to be a significant number of people doing this work. And the question was then, why don't we know about these people? Um, why is there a pervasive uh, assumption promulgated by the firms that uh, there is no intermediary between one's own expression and the platform and then the dissemination to the world? Uh, what, what's to be gained by denying the presence of any, uh, any intermediary at all? And I would argue there's quite a bit to be gained, including uh, uh, really retaining all rights to make decisions uh, while, it, while avoiding much of the responsibility for them. And so uh, that set me off on this, you know, really this quest uh, uh, to apprehend the nature of this phenomenon in all its uh, uh, all its uh, aspects, which meant identifying who the people were who did this work, where they were located, for whom they labored, under what conditions, uh, following what rule sets, and uh, what the what the benefit was essentially to the platforms, and what the implications were for for people like us. And so that has been um, my driving. Uh, set of questions for the last decade. And uh, as you said, uh, Lauren, uh, you know, it is the work of a lifetime because these things change and are mutable and are um, a function of uh, our social world as much as our technological world. So they're in flux, they are influenced by politics and culture, and they also turn around and influence those things. And, and I just, before I uh, end my comment, I just want to say that one of the things that is really exciting to me and important to me is to be able to connect with people like you who take this work and take it into an, a whole other domain that I certainly can't access because I don't have the skill, uh, which is into, uh, into the world of art where you, again, um, reinvent and repurpose and and show another in another way completely and using another vernacular completely the impact and and the meaning of of this work which i call commercial content moderation and i call it that because um there have always been volunteers 
and uh, community members organizing in self-governance on the internet since the internet has been social and the internet has been social since it was created. Uh, but this uh, phenomenon of organized for pay uh, professionals who do this work largely in secret on behalf of these large platforms, that phenomenon I would argue is, is newer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I believe, Hamid, also you prepared uh, some slides to have maybe more uh, a detailed um, view on content moderation and like also you will give us some uh, insight of your own research. Hamid, you're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, yes, thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me thank you and also Mary Ellen and her colleagues for organizing this. Uh, uh, I'm very much uh, pleased to be interacting with all of you. Uh, I have prepared a few slides just to make things maybe more, more accessible. So let me start sharing them. Uh, uh, so what my my angle on on uh, this topic is uh, through what I call the division of uh, labor between humans and machines. Uh, this is what what is everybody doing? Who is producing content? Who is uh, consuming it? Uh, what are machines doing in between, and so on? And on the surface, it, this might sound as I should try to show in this image a, a very simple scenario where you know uh, there's content that people produce. That content could be text or video or photographs or whatever. And then uh, they're on the other end, you know, the same people or others might be you know, using this content. But uh, that's a very simplistic image, actually. When you look closer, uh, it becomes very complex. So, uh, you know, if you look at a YouTube, which is the paragon of content creation and content consum consumption, uh, the image involves many other players, you know, from, you know, YouTube itself and the IP holders and advertisers and the audiences and the partners and so on and so forth. This is a image, an image that one of our doctoral students, Brian Harper, uh, has created, you know, trying for us to basically to get a sense of the flow of not only content, but how it relates to the flow of data and advertising and money and so on and so forth. So, so uh, it's uh, really, really very, very, very complex. And when it comes to offensive content, it adds uh, another dimension. Uh, and to show how, I want to just briefly to, to talk about this uh, event that many of us might remember last year in El Paso, Texas, where this young uh, man, you know, uh, traveled, you know, hundreds of miles to come to El Paso, essentially to kill uh, Latinos. He ended up killing 23 people and injuring another 23, kind of recording, uh, according to accounts, uh, the most uh, violent uh, anti-Latino accident of modern history in the US. Uh, before that, he had posted a manifesto on this right-wing channel, which is called the A channel. And uh, that manifesto was taken down right after that incident, but uh, it is archived on the web. So I went to the archive and I found, uh, you know, this and other than the foul language that he uses to talk about his intentions and his plans to massacre people, essentially, uh, you, you see, uh, the image uh, uh, that you see on the right side of uh, an advertisement for Japanese sex toys. Um, so speaking of, you know, offensive content, uh, look at what is happening here in, in the, you know, in, in a very uh, kind of isolated corner of the internet. But then people looked at his history and they found a tweet of the same person, this assailant, from 2017, uh, where he had retweeted uh, something about Bill O'Reilly. Many of you might know that he was an anchor on Fox News, thanking Bill O'Reilly 
for libertal tears. Of course, that's a misspelling. What he means is liberal tears. And what liberal tears is, is originally a gun cleaning oil, uh, which has turned into its brand, own brand name. Now they have, you know, mugs and uh, you know, coffee and energy drinks and so on with this brand. And the mug that you see on the right side with the image of uh, Donald Trump is uh, one example of, of these products that they sell with this brand. Uh, to add insult to injury, the president of the United States, or should I say the outgoing president of the United States, is uh, you know tweeted you know at, after the event, but then look what he said at the bottom. This legislation will desperately needed immigration reform. We must have something good, if not great, come out of these two tragic events. So, as, so you see that there's a very complex ecology here of uh, you know of uh, white supremacist who kills people. And then that it involves also the president of the United States. It involves a news, a major news anchor. It involves Japanese sex toys. That involves, you know, the images, the gruesome images of people uh, mourning the loss, their losses in, you know, in El Paso, and so on and so forth. And the question for us, as I think, as a, as a topic for today, for instance, is how can we deal with this? You know. How can we fix this? I think that's a question that anybody who who thinks about uh, you know the, the internet and content on the internet uh, takes very seriously. So, what are the responses? I, th I think you know we can imagine three possible responses. One was uh, what happened in in New Zealand, what is called the Christchurch call, where in response to a similar event, they essentially. Uh, uh, stopped you know tried to stop you know the uh, the spread of violence and extreme content. Uh, and it was rather successful, at least within uh, their sovereign domains. The other re response is to say, okay, let's, let's you know, improve technology so that technology could do this. If you listen to people such as Mark Zuckerberg, that's what he wants us to believe that, you know, that AI and automation can deal with this and it's going to take care of this for us. So the problem that is created by technology is going to be solved by more technology. Some, some people call that techno-solutionism. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, this of course doesn't work. You know, they didn't, didn't work 10 years ago, still doesn't work. And Zuckerberg knows more, more than anybody else that that doesn't work, which is why they are hiring, you know, hundreds, dozens and hundreds and uh, thousands literally of people in the US and around the globe to, to deal with this issue. Which brings me to this third possibility, you know, what, what can people do? And we already heard from both of you about, you know, what, what the people are doing. But just before I get to people, I wanted to mention that, you know, there's a lot of hype about AI nowadays and uh, its capabilities. There have been improvements, needless to say, but, but there are still major barriers. I mean, I don't have time to get into this, but, you know, language barrier, you know, a visual barrier, you know, visual perception has been, or visual processing has improved quite a bit, but there are still a lot of loopholes um, in, in AI systems and most significantly meaning barrier. So just to give you an example. So imagine an AI system gets this content that I was just talking about, liberal tears. You know, what do you think an AI system is going to be capable of doing with that? Uh, but who are liberals? What are, what are their tears? What does the tears have to do? What do the tears have to do with uh, gun cleaning oil? Why should the president of the United States get involved in that? But who is Bob Bill O'Reilly? What did he say about all of this? You see what I mean? It's very complex and there's no way, and I repeat that, no way that any AI system now or in the near or foreseeable future going to be able to deal with this, which is why we end up with humans again. So my my perspective on this is what I call heteromation, the book that, uh, that Lauren mentioned. And um, we did this with Bonnie Nardi and heteromation um, kind of uh, is a word play on, on automation as you can imagine, but the hetero refers to the other. In the automation scenario, systems work by themselves. In heteromation, they work 
by others or for others. Actually, the hetero there has both connotations. The others, in, in our case, when we talk about content moderation, is all the people who are doing clean the things behind the scene, as, as Sarah described, right? Those are the, the others who are doing the work, but they are not acknowledged, they are erased, they are made invisible, you know, and they are rarely, you know, uh, rewarded, you know. Um, nowadays, it has become a job, as uh, again, uh, as we heard, and uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but heteromation is much broader than this, you know, it is, and every time you go uh, online and contribute in your data or your images or your even your stories, that becomes the source of value for major corporations, uh, such as Facebook and Google and all the rest of them. Uh, so heteromation is a new mechanism of you know, value extraction or wealth creation, which is why you know, we see what we see in the Bay Area, you know, these major corporations having grown in the last you know, couple of decades because of their membership and because of what their members do. And it uh, works according to a logic of inclusivity. You know, come, come on over, you know, you are all part of this. And Zuckerberg again famously said that you get from the network uh, whatever you put into it. That's very inaccurate. Uh, people uh, do not get as much from the network as they put into it. And actually Zuckerberg and his ilk get uh, you know, a lot of from it, but not, not, not the rest of us. So that's uh, my angle on this, you know, in terms of both content moderation, but more broadly in terms of that notion of the division of labor between humans and machines and who is doing what. Uh, and just to give you a, an example related to this and to finish my, my comments, um, this is, uh, there was an article in Verge about uh, what uh, these content moderators uh, and this woman that you see, young woman who works in, in actually happens to be working for Accenture in Texas, doing content moderation uh, for Google. And he, she, the story, this is uh, not the only case, but uh, she, her story is one of PTSD, where she has, uh, you know, gone through a lot of, you know, psychological issues because of what she does. And this doesn't stop in, in uh, you know, in our borders. There's a major international component to this, which is even more gruesome and more sad. Uh, if you look up on the internet, you know, for content moderation, you come across companies such as this. This is in the Philippines. And because in the Philippines, people speak English, such as in, you know, some other countries, India and Pakistan, they are very good targets for hiring content moderators. Uh, it's very kind of sad to say the least to see people advertising themselves on these websites for doing content moderation on the cheap, really. You know, look at this young woman, $5 an hour. This young man, $4 an hour. So this is what is happening. And there, there's a whole bunch of them on this website. And this is just one example. So uh, to finish this, I, I really want to highlight what uh, Sarah already said, and that is that, that uh, technology is really not capable of dealing with this. Uh, the, the issue, the problem is growing in, ex, uh, in its uh, depth and its uh, scope, and we are going to see more of this. And uh, that uh, adds, you know, to the pain that people are already, uh, you know, such as these employees uh, are going through, whether it is in the U.S. or it is in other parts of the globe. Uh, and uh, I hope that we find ways to uh, to fix this, but let's talk about that, you know, uh, hear about that from, from uh, other people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Um, I will jump to Sarah and uh, ask another question so she can, she can develop a bit more um, about, um, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, what were your uh, motivations in writing the book behind the screen? And um, if you can tell us some. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a one thing I can't control in the space today is the cat. So, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to deal with that. Um, you can leave the cats. Perfect. Uh, so basically, um, the book behind the screen, which is now uh, available in French translation, derrière les écrans, uh, just came out in French uh, last month. For those who may be interested. 
it it really is uh, the culmination of um, the research that I described beginning in 2010, where I uh, attempted to find, you know, it's really the story of finding the, the places geographically, uh, organizationally, and also uh, socially where these uh, where these workers, these commercial content moderators reside and trying to uh, basically create a map by tracing the perimeter, right? So really being on the outside of this phenomenon, because as you can imagine, uh, no companies when I went uh, to find these workers were really interested in opening their doors to me uh, in 2010. And so I had to find other ways to find workers. Now, part of the reason for the difficulty was because uh, social media companies blanket these workers in non-disclosure agreements or NDAs, which preclude them from talking about their work. And to uh, Hamid's points made in the presentation so succinctly, uh, there are uh, reasons that have to do, obviously, they, the companies themselves will claim that it has to do with uh, kind of industrial secrets and not wanting to give away things, um, you know, hints to allow bad actors to game the system. But it also has to do with uh, a, a pervasive ideology that I found uh, present in, in this phenomenon, which was uh, that if possible, whenever possible, computers should be doing the problem solving. And it's it's this aspirational uh, orientation towards computation and towards AI in particular that we're almost there. We're almost there to the point where we can turn this over to computers. Until that time, we have the stopgap measure of humans uh, so it's, you know, really don't pay attention to that too much because soon it will be automated. And as if, you know, by being, by virtue of simply being automated or computational, it's somehow uh, better, fairer, uh, more uh, reliably reproduced. I don't think any of those things are even uh, certain, a certainty <laughs> anyway, but that is the uh, predisposition of uh, those who make these technologies and these platforms. Um, to solve the problem with technology as, as described. In other words, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very limited scope and they therefore have treated this workforce, which now is in the hundreds of thousands and is global as uh, temporary, as uh, something that will eventually go away and as an afterthought. So the book is really, um, it's the story uh, as much as possible in their, their own words of people who do this work. And they do this work on behalf of a firm called, as a, you know, used as a pseudonym, Megatech in the book um, in Silicon Valley. They do this work uh, sometimes in using Mechanical Turk. They do this work uh, sometimes in the Philippines. So I had to uh, trace the trajectory of the labor from the United States around the globe to, uh, to Manila. And what I discovered about the work was that it is, uh, it is a globalized outsourced practice, even though it takes place in many different um, organizational and industrial contexts and registers. Uh, so the call center is now sort of the primary site where you'll find this, but there are other sites, as I describe in the book, and other kinds of um, organizational arrangements. And so, it, you know, in a way, it was like uh, pursuing a mystery because uh, I had to find traces, uh, clues, uh, pistes, as, as we would say, right, in French, follow the, these clues to find where the people were in part by absence. So it was like a very complicated uh, um, uh, challenge to try to figure out almost like where there's a black hole, you can sense a gravitational pull, but you can't necessarily see it. So what you do is you see the activity around it to kind of know that it's there. And that's how, you know, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like, um, you know, I chose the space motif, not by accident. It felt like being in outer space, trying, you know, in the dark, trying to find uh, 
things that were were being deliberately hidden. And so um, the book gives voice to these workers first and foremost, which was my my goal and my intent. But it also really serves as uh, as a document of the trajectory I had to follow around the world to, to follow the labor and to follow the flow of the work patterns, as well as to follow the data as the data were transmitted around the globe through undersea cables that link up um, the west coast of the United States to the Philippines and very uh, uh, unsurprisingly follow the shipping routes uh, of, of commercial commerce that have been established now uh, for uh, a, 150 years at least since the Philippines was uh, colonized first by the Spanish and then by the United States. So it's also a history of global economics uh, in, in essence and of, of uh, political conquest and other kinds of uh, notions of empire uh, that, you know, the Philippines is almost serving as a, a, a vassal state here or serving as a a fundamental source of labor for North America. And that's no mistake. It's because of, uh, as Hamid said, that the, the capacity for uh, many Filipino people to speak English, well, that's what happens when your country is colonized for a hundred years by another country. You learn the language of the colonizer, right? So one of the things that a, a, a person I know who read the book said to me, uh, that I, I really felt was a compliment was she said it was a page turner that read like a thriller. And, uh, you know, that that is how it felt. It felt like I was um, chasing, you know, chasing a mystery. Uh, and it was something that uh, the firms I knew were reluctant to have uh, uh, un unveiled in this way. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Hamid, maybe we can jump on, um, you know, like um, this uh, book that you 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 wrote, Heteromation uh, and other stories about computing and capitalism. Can you explain us quickly the main ideas behind this book and uh, maybe um, definition of heteromation for people that don't uh, that are not familiar with that term? Sure, Lauren. Uh, I, I, as I said earlier, very briefly, uh, the idea here is that, you know, capitalism is a very interesting system. Let me start with that, that it is very resilient uh, and it reinvents itself. Uh, and that is one of the, the sources of its uh, uh, success and its endurance um, in the last well, 200 years and so on. And needless to say, it has created a lot of well, it's a lot of opportunities, you know, uh, people like to remind us that uh, the, the amount of wealth that humanity has created in the last 200 years is multiple uh, times, maybe multiple hundred times uh, bigger than whatever we had created throughout our, all of human history. That is a fact. The sad part of it is that that wealth is distributed very unevenly across the globe. And as we see these days in the US itself, even within uh, this, this very country, which is the, the, the leader of the capitalist world, right? Uh, so one of the, the key mechanisms that capitalism invents or reinvents the users to, is, is, you know, for wealth creation. How could, how could you create wealth? That is a big question. Uh, uh, and that has changed, you know, uh, and actually not only it has changed, it has been kind of accumulated throughout, uh, you know, the decades. So early on, it was just, you know, industrial work and people working in factories uh, and so on and so forth. Then by the, uh, the mid 20th century, we moved to this, what is what's called the service economy and uh, people creating value uh, through their, you know, skills and art and labor, you know, you as an artist, I'm sure you realize, you know, how, how you can contribute, uh, how you are contributing, you know, to value creation um, in, in this economy and so on. Uh, but uh, as we, you know, we got more and more into computing technology, a new opportunity was created. And the internet kind of speeded that up, accelerated the process by giving people access to this technology in the sense that now uh, 
there was this, this kind of drive to pull people in. But that's what I mean when I said, uh, I meant when I said the logic by inclusion. Uh, this new capitalism is very smart in the sense that it wants you to be involved. You, it, you know, you hear this term participation, engagement, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, not only about, you know, entertainment, but also about work. You know, people oftentimes, you know, even nowadays, especially nowadays, actually, after the COVID, people find themselves working maybe 15 hours a day rather than, you know, the, the good old eight hour day work, right? Uh, for, for their employers, for their, you know, companies and so on and so forth, because this technology has created that possibility. And that's how people are valued. You know, if you don't do that, you're not uh, a desired and ideal employee. But on top of that, a lot of other people, essentially all of us are producing value for this economy. And that is what this notion of heteromation is trying to get at. How do we create value? Well, whenever you go and stand in the line in the grocery store, you know, uh, in the auto checkout line, uh, you're doing the job, uh, you know, the work that somebody else was doing for paid labor. Now you as a customer do that. You don't consider it work. You say, okay, I'm doing, you know, my shopping, but actually that's what you are doing. You're producing value for that grocery store, for that, you know, supermarket. Whenever you go to the airport, you do the same. When you go online and or call on, you know, and do things, you know, on your own, uh, which were previously done, in, you know, by employees, you are producing value. When you go to the bank nowadays, you do the same. So uh, that's one kind of corner of the economy, which is, uh, you know, extracting a lot of value from people through their just daily activities. But the bigger part maybe is through our data. And that it relates to what, uh, what you're discussing today in terms of, uh, you know, content creation and so on. Uh, as I said earlier, whenever you, you email, you know, somebody, your friend, your family member, your colleague, that by itself, your effort to, you know, you're communicating with somebody, but that turns into a source of value for some corporation or set of corporations. Whenever you post a, an image or a video uh, or, you know, you like somebody, you just post, you know, uh, you know, say you like an image. All of that turns into, you know, sources of information about you, but also about, uh, you know, uh, uh, other people, your friends, your family, your colleagues, your working environments and so on. And that is a new game. And uh, this is one of the, the kind of inventions, if you wish, of capitalism, this new face of capitalism in the last 20, 30 years, uh, which is again, as I said earlier, which, is ex which explains why we see the growth of the economy mostly in that sector, you know, uh, without really, really, and that is uh, another dimension which is kind of uh, uh, forgotten and without really adding a lot of value to people's lives, you know, cats and dogs and so on are, Yes, it's nice to, to have videos and it's nice to, for people to be able to express themselves in these online environments, but it really doesn't put that much of a bread on anybody's table. You know, the, the number of people that these companies employ compared to their equivalents, you know, in the previous economy, they're really, really minor, you know, uh, which is, uh, and why, why is that possible? How could, how could it be that they have so few employees I mean, altogether, all of Silicon Valley, by my estimate, is less than 200,000 employees at the moment. I mean, uh, you can add the content moderators and so on around the globe, but the core of these companies is interesting. But their stock, uh, their market value is in the billions and trillions, right? And this is an interesting question. How could companies that employ so few people be so rich? And the answer is that all of us, all the rest of us are producing value for them. Uh, and that is, that is what heteromation is trying to basically to do, that it is really just a facade when they talk about AI and automation and so on. It's still people who are doing a lot of work. COVID gave us actually a very good indication. Why do the, you know, the, uh, why is this urge you know, to, to bring people back to work? If there's all these automation systems that can make things work, why do we need people to go back to work? Well, because as we have seen in the last few months, people need, are needed, you know, for the most basic jobs and for the most sophisticated jobs, it doesn't matter. 
Thank you, um, Hamid. Thank you for this precious. I, I've never thought that going to the supermarket for me, uh, just being in the line was adding value to the company, but of course it does. I was just like, I'm so much uh, intrigued by extraction of data online that I always forgot, like if I go shopping, I, I, I do the same. <laughs> um, then um, maybe we can jump like on uh, getting back to uh, content moderation and like the effect of uh, images, you know, um, by this uh, population, this uh, pool of workers that are doing that job. And um, Sarah, I was just curious if you, I'm sure you met many, many moderators and um, I was wondering uh, you know, what was the toll, what, like how they are dealing with all this content and what type of content they were uh, facing? <clears throat> well, I think the first thing that bears mentioning here too, uh, to pick up the thread of the ways in which uh, this globalized capitalism is at play is that it, it has a, a, it has a, a characteristic of placing everyone inside its logic, whether you have assented to that or not. And so one of the ways that, yeah, right. One of the ways that um, we can witness that just in this conversation is that we're using terms like content, right? Uh, to mean essentially the gamut of human self-expression. That's really what content is online. And so I always find it so curious that um, we have all collectively adopted these industry terms, uh, myself included, uh, because they are, are really um, meaningful only in the context of this value creation for the firms. And it really means that uh, you take all of this human self-expression for all of the reasons that it, from the most banal to the most significant and important reasons that someone might want to emote or share or, or uh, bear witness to something online and have others see it. And it, it is reduced to its, uh, to, to its only one fraction, you know, only one uh, facet of, of, its, of its value, which is economic value, right? And that is a very, I mean, ironically, that's a very poor uh, kind of uh, extraction. It, it, you know, it only takes, it only recognizes a certain kind of value and uh, the rest of it is, um, is sort of uh, extraneous. So, you know, it, 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 has a, it has the effect of basically flattening everything into this one, into this one uh, bucket called content. And for regular people, that doesn't mean anything. It, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a meaningless term. Um, so in that regard, when you are on, you know, when you are serving as one of these people who sits in this production chain between uh, the creation or the, 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 the sharing of material, um, you, uh, you actually are subject to the same kind of logic that says, you know, content is content is content. And particularly in the beginning, it, it, it's, it's a, a little bit more sophisticated now in, in, in a variety of cases, but not necessarily. Uh, but certainly in the beginning, one of the kinds of results of this logic was that for the moderators, they would just receive a barrage of material without knowing anything about its context, its origin, its in, you know, the intent of it. Um, it. Was this material being shared just because it was titillating or did it have an advocacy purpose? None of that was kind of present. And they just sort of saw an image or a posting or video one after another. Uh, and to your point about what, you know, what kind of material were they seeing, I would invite everyone to go to their platform of choice and look for the community guidelines or the uh, other kinds of agreements, user facing agreements about what's permissible and what is impermissible on the platform. And when you see what's impermissible, now imagine seeing that constantly because 
of course, the, the impermissible material is being funneled to these workers by, by virtue of user uh, complaints and users submitting reports about disturbing or inappropriate content. And so this would all flow to the workers, particularly in the early days with, with no context through um, you know, a kind of dedicated queues that would hold these, uh, hold these uh, reports. And workers would, would see image after image, uh, sometimes so wrote that they described their work like factory work. So taking us back to that 20th century uh, uh, assembly line economy, even though we have to acknowledge that there was no physical harm that could come to them, they weren't going to lose a finger, they weren't going to lose a, a limb in a, um, in a press or, you know, be burned in a foundry. But there were other damages possible. And of course, the workers themselves were the ones who were starting to recognize that uh, the outcome on themselves of viewing these impermissible, inappropriate, unwanted images over and over again, um, you know, sort of had two possible end games. One was burnout because you would become, you'd kind of hit the wall at some point and reach a point where I've had enough uh, and you would kind of move on to do something else because you decided that you'd had your limit and reached capacity. But perhaps even more disturbing, um, the other outcome was desensitization, was a worker becoming inured to uh, the disturbing content, animal abuse, child abuse, child sexual exploitation, um, gore and violence, just kind of gross out material. Uh, pornography, et cetera, they would become so inured and desensitized that they were also no longer a good judge of what would, what, you know, crossed the line and what just came up to it. And so uh, one of the features of this kind of work that I found was that it was often um, limited term. And the workers that I spoke to at Megatech were only allowed to do this job for two years before they had to move on. In part, uh, because of this issue that I just described of the outcomes either being burnout or desensitization, but also because um, as contractors, uh, the companies who were, who were contracting their labor did not want to be accused of having long-term contractors who were really full-time employees because they were trying to avoid giving them all the benefits of full-time employees that uh, in the United States are actually a necessity for things like healthcare. So, uh, you know, th these were kinds of the conditions of labor. And uh, as, you, uh, as you kind of further atomize the, uh, the, the, uh, the experience of viewing this content, you know, you could take it almost to the absurd where workers who were using microtask uh, uh, platforms such as Mechanical Turk or one that was called at the time Crowdflower, there, there are a whole host of these, uh, might actually be doing content moderation on a per image basis uh, where they're paid for the images that they see. And I had seen advertisements um, soliciting this kind of work where the pay was one cent per image, literally about as low as you can go uh, because you couldn't really be paid in fractional amounts here. So one cent per image, uh, and there's no sense of responsibility or re relationship at all between the worker and the whomever was soliciting this work. So, you know, it's atomized down to the image view and the worker uh, employee relationship is also completely obliterated in that context. And that's, you know, when you follow this, this story and you follow it globally and you follow it sort of um, hierarchically in terms of work organization, this is the, uh, you know, this is actually the final outcome of this type of capitalism. I mean, there, th this is the end game, is to get the cheapest labor, the most uh, production at the cheapest cost. And that is why the, um, the labor has also circulated around the globe. It, it has sought out the skills, it has sought out the linguistic competencies, 
the, um, the, the cultural knowledge, the ability to read for symbols from other parts of the world, world et cetera. So it's, it's uh, benefited from uh, and, and relies upon histories of, of colonization in that way, but it's also chasing the lowest possible pay, you know, the cheapest labor, the, the most devaluing of this work. Uh, and so that's kind of the twin story of, of how these workers sit and what they're called on to do. And, you know, again, as um, Hamid mentioned, in this time of COVID, we've really come to recalibrate our thinking in terms of what work is essential and not essential. Uh, so one of the very curious phenomena that was an outcome of the earliest quarantines was that the main pl major platforms, US-based platforms were suddenly putting up notices if you tried to report problematic content, uh, warning there may be a delay in responding to this due to the COVID epidemic. Well, that's because uh, call centers in other places uh, in, the, on the, in the globe, uh, closer to um, origin points of the pandemic we're shutting down and shutting down before we were doing so in the West. So in a way that was the migration back from East to West. Um, and we saw that kind of rolling process as these workers went offline and were sent away uh, from the call centers where they labored. Uh, and it had that rippling effect in the United States. I actually wrote an article about this and called it the great AI beta test because this was the chance for the firms to put their their claims about we're almost you know, to the point where AI and other computational tools can do this work. Guess what? As soon as they could recall those workers, they did. And those workers have come back online uh, as uh, quarantines have been lifted. Of course, we're still very much in the pandemic. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, before we hand, um, I, I see there is a question in the, in the, in the Participant, I want to ask a question for both of you. Um, have, um, what solutions uh, you can see? What, what are the solutions that we can collectively put together, or what solution those companies, you know, like the responsibility of companies can can have toward their users? Like, uh, do you have any hints or like any um, finding? Sarah or yeah, I mean, I'll just say briefly that, um, as you can imagine, it's a difficult question. And in yeah. Part, the, the, yeah, you know, like, I wish I had the, the quick answer, but I don't. But in part, again, this, this fractured, um, hidden and globalized nature of the work, the way that yeah. the, you know, the firms have chosen to set up this workforce, uh, it, it actually precludes a lot of uh, the um, the obvious ways that that could mitigate the harm, which would include worker organizing uh, and you know lessons from from labor organizing from the past uh, uh, couple centuries around that. Uh, so you know if you disperse the workers all over the world, uh, it, it makes it harder. If you create um, uh, a class of contractors and subcontractors, now you're introducing layers of distance geographically and organizationally between the companies soliciting the content moderation and those who do it. And it, it reminds me of the textile industry in that regard where the factory collapses in Bangladesh, garments are pulled out among the rubble and among the dead. And then apparently uh, without any sense of, you know, uh, it being ridiculous, H&M, Walmart, Zara can all say, we didn't even know our garments were being produced there. So uh, I guess what I would say then as a, as a mechanism to better the situation, one thing that workers always say to me is we don't wanna be contractors. We wanna be direct employees. We wanna be direct employees of Facebook, of YouTube, of these other firms, um, Twitter, et cetera. But to Hamid's point, there is uh, both an ideological and a financial purpose behind keeping the uh, employee footprint so-called lean, 
at these firms. It's it's a it's a, an ideological preference that uh, you know the the companies think they can point at computation as um, being the reason for the small workforce, which of course you know workforce benefits etc. is a huge cost center on firms. And so investors like to see those lean workforces. But you know, at some companies, uh, now the ratio of the, the content moderators versus uh, the, the direct employees of the company, including the people who set the policy for the content moderators, I might add, is one to one. Uh, and pretty soon the content moderators will well outnumber the direct employees themselves too. Uh, so we have to really ask ourselves what constitutes being an employee. And here in, where I live in California, we just had a ballot measure to disallow Uber, Lyft, and all of these other uh, gig economy employers from um, not directly hiring the people that do the work for them and considering them contact, uh, contractors. They blitzed the media, they blitzed all their apps so that if you opened Uber to take a ride, you'd be confronted with advertising that said, you know, vote no on Proposition 22 and the proposition completely failed uh, because of the, you know, the industry's power in continuing to dictate this relationship of contracting to frankly take no responsibility for uh, the workers who may come to harm in the process of doing the work for these companies. <laughs> So to answer the question, we have to look at the way the workers are classified. Um, we have to make sure that local labor laws are enforced where they exist, where they don't exist, we should have stronger uh, labor laws. And I think you know, those laws have to, have to reflect a 21st century reality where a lot of people aren't going to work on a factory floor. They aren't you know, all co-located in one site. And especially we don't know after COVID if people are even going to return to a, a, you know, an office block or a, a manufacturing site like we had prior. We don't know what that new, uh, what that new work landscape will look like. Uh, but right now the, the benefit is really to the employer almost entirely. And that is an imbalance. Mm -hmm. I have some thoughts, but let's have get the questions from the audience. I think you know, uh, so, so maybe we can also co come back to this later. Yes, um, Mary, do you want to read it, or should I read it? Um, well, actually, first uh, we've let someone in who raised their hand. Um, if you would like uh, retinue, I think is what it says there. If you turn on your camera and on your mic, you'll appear with all all of us here. Hello. Hi. Um, I was curious about this really kind of nuanced overlap between heteromation and content moderation, where users are doing a kind of first layer of the labor by flagging content. Um, and then that work is actually used to some degree to train algorithms, as far as I know. Um, but it's the humans are a very unreliable um, labor force in this case because some of the most flagged content is Justin Bieber videos, for instance. Um, but I was curious if about this this point of overlap between the algorithm and the human and how that works a little bit more in with regards to content moderation. Uh, that, that's a very uh, good point. Uh, thanks for uh, for bringing it up. Uh, bringing it up. Uh, is it re retinue or retina? All right. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is. You know, we have to look at this. Is this also goes back to the earlier question uh, at different layers? I think there's no single answer to this, and that's what I think Sarah was getting at as well. That there's there is the the labor component of this, uh, but also the broader cultural component. Uh, you know, uh, the, what happened in New Zealand, for instance, you know, they, they adopted the right policies to harness this, right? So we cannot just continue doing what we do. You know, we cannot allow this. This, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that these are easy to resolve. This brings up in the US, especially the question of the freedom of speech 
and so on. But these should be looked at as a package. You know, we have to look at this from the, you know, the free, you know, the uh, constitutional rights of citizens in, in expressing themselves, but also to balance that out against these other issues of labor and, you know, and value creation and so on and so forth. So it, I'm, it's not an easy thing to do, but to, to be, to give a more specific question, answer to your question about this overlap between heteromation and content moderation. This is one of the things that, you know, the, the discourses that, that uh, the, the big technology companies try to drive. And that is that, you know, human beings are not reliable uh, and hence we have to go to technology. Well, it turns out that technology is not also reliable. So we have to step back and see, okay, uh, if the technology is not the answer, we, and we know that for sure, right? What are some of the ways to put human intelligence, human you know, judgment into good action here, right? And that is when poli where policy comes in. We need the right policies. In the absence of policies, then we are all lost in this vacuum, right? But, but, which uh, can neither rely on human judgment nor on technology. And then things become more, worse and worse. That's a kind of brief comment uh, of thinking about this. Yeah, I'll just add that, of course, that um, relationship that uh, was described in the question, of course, that's absolutely correct uh, in, in this kind of reactive content moderation that is, um, that is be where the process is begun by a user report. Users, quote unquote, users, or as I might call them, people, um, you know, people begin the process with their own labor, with their own um, with their own discernment, which, uh, you know, has been monetized and has a value extraction uh, in the context of the platforms at, when they submit those reports. So that you're hundred percent right that that is, um, you know, that is perhaps where, where that process begins. And then uh, there is a, a dual function of the decision-making that the moderators make, whereby uh, their decisions are made to uh, automate uh, tools that could ostensibly replace them. However, I'll say that uh, with the rise of more computational tools, what's actually happened is there's more proactive um, screening of content where these tools go out and they kind of swoop all this material in, material that maybe never would have been viewed. So it's terrible and it exists, but it's in the ecosystem somewhere with no views, no clicks. And um, now bringing it in through uh, automated means means that there has to be more moderators to do checks on, uh, on the computational tools to make sure what they're doing is correct. Uh, so in a way, the logic of uh, automation in many ways and at, at many points of this in, these inputs that I just tried to identify calls upon more humans to be involved, uh, but but their inputs erased by this kind of myth of everything being automated. And I'll just close my comment by saying the epigraph to my book was a quip that a professor of mine made when I was working on my master's degree uh, in information studies at the University of Wisconsin. She said, oh, "Computer human human computer interaction. I mean, what other kind is there?" Thank you. I think we should take one of the questions from the Q&A. We've got three. We don't have very much time left. In fact, it says a minute, but I think we could go over a little bit. Um, is there one question in particular? I think the question by Clara Balliger is very interesting. Maybe I should read it out loud. Um, she said, being from the Philippines, we are often characterized as automatons without the ability to produce our own knowledge or have agency beyond being a vassal state, as you mentioned, subjugated to by previous colonizers. In your field work, uh, did you observe or seek out forms of agent contribution in places like the Philippines? Was there any locally developed know-how in these videos uh, firm existed, like local activism, advocacy, or research? Uh, I assume that's for me. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. The answer is yes. I went to the Philippines and uh, uh, met many people working in BPOs, business process outsourcing uh, is, is the term that is used in the industry to describe um, 
call centers that provide service support for uh, other kinds of activities in firms. And of course, uh, people in the Philippines are not um, monolithic and they're not, uh, you know, without agency whatsoever. Uh, I think, in fact, it is the, uh, <laughs> you know, it's the system itself that is devised by the North American firms that uh, demands uh, that that agency and identity be erased in order to often masquerade uh, as uh, North Americans or act like you're somewhere you're not or to be uh, swimming in a in a another culture all day. I mean, I, I consider that uh, an incredibly highly skilled thing to be able to do, working uh, among many languages, being aware of cultural contexts across the world often. Um, you know, that is highly skilled in my opinion. It is the, the, the setup itself that has somewhat devalued that. Now, of course, it's not so easy to say uh, that there's, there's, you know, worker exploitation in this field full stop. Uh, the workers that I spoke to in the Philippines, um, all of them had four-year college degrees. They were all young, sophisticated, urban people. Most of them did not live directly uh, in the areas where they worked because those areas are, of course, uh, special economic zones uh, under PESA. But they, um, you know, they were urbanites. They were sophisticated and they had... Uh, compared to other choices and occupations, good wages. They had the ability to work in, a, in an office building in a skyscraper sometimes, or in an office building that was air conditioned, which we know in Manila is a thing. It's really hot in Manila. So, you know, it's not like um, it's a, that simple of a story. Uh, but I think when you look at the kinds of value that I just described that are, that is brought to the table by these workers and the ways that the wages and other kinds of recognition for the work are suppressed or depressed by the firms themselves, there is a disconnect. And that goes for workers in the United States too. Um, a year and a half ago, Facebook made an announcement that they were raising across the board, they were going to raise uh, the rate of pay for all the workers they had in call centers in the United States. And that meant, you know, people who were working for third party firms, just like they do in the Philippines, um, they were going to raise the wage. And I thought, I'm never against that. I was like, great, let's do it. So they were raising the minimum wage for all of their workers to $15 an hour. And in some of the more uh, expensive metro areas like uh, the Bay Area and other places, they were going to raise it to $18 an hour. So that's great, When, except when you realize what did that mean about what the workers were being paid before that announcement. Also, I sort of was waiting for other firms to kind of follow suit. And that was a deafening silence. There were no other firms that made a similar announcement, right? So. There is a hierarchy of labor uh, where there is primacy put on things like engineering and technical knowledge and um, maybe policy kind of at a secondary level in the firms, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. And then, um, you know, operations. And that goes across the board for operations of all kind. Uh, and then we know that there are all kinds of support workers on site at these places too cafeteria workers, um, cleanup crews. I mean, play, people for, for whom their work is essential. And if they were uh, found to be in absence, the place would fall apart, but they're not recognized as such by the firms themselves through pay, through recognition of their work or in any other ways. So no, it's, it's not a simple story uh, with the Philippines by any means. And in the book, I go to great pains to articulate um, just, just how it's not. Thank I just want to add here really quick that when I went to Manila, we met with a union, a workers union called BN, and they're doing an amazing job for the business process uh, outsource. Um, that 
that's it. There's a last uh, question, uh, maybe in the Q&A, but maybe we're uh, over time. Mary, what do you... Yes, we're out of time, unfortunately. And it also appears that I'm disappearing somehow, I see. <laughs> uh, but I, we, unfortunately, we have, to, we have to end the event today. But thank you so much, everyone, for this rich conversation. Um, it's been great. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Hamid. Thank, thank you for having Mary. me. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, I just want to add really quick that uh, I'm very, uh, very grateful for your participation today. And also that um, during this one year residency, I will be very much interested to be in contact with content moderators or people that work in the field. And um, if uh, you want to reach me, you can reach me uh, on my email address. Um, my email address is like, you can type my first name and last name on, on Google and you'll see my uh, website and you can reach me. Otherwise, I think there will be some kind of message in the chat of Swiss Next. Yes. Uh, with my email address. So yeah. Um, Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, all the participants. And sorry for the question that couldn't be answered. And um, if you're in the US, uh, I wish you a really good day. And uh, if you are in Europe, uh, good bon appétit, as we say here. Bye, everyone. Merci, Lorraine. <laughs> bye, Sarah. Bye, Hamid. Oh, bye. Uh